Hello, my name is Sue and I am an engineer. But I'm in good company, so this is good. I'm also going to use a cliche, sorry Lily, <laughs> where we start to use Leonardo da Vinci again to talk about interdisciplinary thought. He did say that uh, the best way, why would we mess with that? So study the art of science, study the science of art, develop your senses, learn how to see and realize that everything connects to everything else. So on that note, let's go to engineering. Traditional engineering really can be seen as a black box. So what I mean by that is that engineers will see a need or a need will be brought to them and then they will go and they'll define the problem according to criteria and then they'll come back with a solution and they'll provide the solution. The people who require the, the solution or the people who are, are, are asking about this need uh, are rarely part of the process. But times are changing. So even mechanical engineers now have realized that we need to take in the voices of people who are not engineers and bring them as part of the uh, solution so that we can solve some of the challenges that we have today. And we need these ideas now to become part of the engineering curriculum. At this point, uh, we're relying on individuals. We're relying on individuals to reach out and talk to people outside of engineering and uh, to be engaged with people. And we need to show students that there's a, a, a benefit to this right from, right from day one. So what we need is the white box. The white box, we're talking about transparency. We're talking about how we need to take the tools of engineering, which are the process of, of engineering, out of the black box uh, and engage people and show them that uh, our processes can be worked with other people and that we can work on solutions together. So at its core, this comes down to respect. We need engineers to have respect for the arts and sciences and we need the arts and sciences to have respect for engineers. In the university, we tend to be in silos, so that's not always, that respect is not always obvious, let's say. So, I thought, speaking of respect, I'd give a little background on who I am and why I've come to this. <clears throat> I'm an ocean engineer, a naval architectural ocean engineer. I also teach yoga. Uh, I have a degree in science, and when I went through my bachelor degree in engineering, I don't think I would have survived if I hadn't had studio courses in fine arts and drawing and painting. A lot of people will say, oh, you're not a regular engineer, you're not, you know, normal, you're not like all those en other engineers I, I know, but I think uh, Mo and Luke have shown that I'm in good company and there's lots of us around, and uh, we just need to build on that. So, I believe that leaving the arts and the accompanying training and critical thought that we get from the arts out of traditional engineering education is actually doing a disservice to engineers in the same way that leaving out math and the beauty of science out of arts programs is doing a disservice to those students. So why, what do the creative arts have to offer? Well, it's easy to say it will help make them more creative. But creativity isn't developed by taking a course here and there. Creativity comes and, and is nurtured when you have the tools and skills to express your ideas and you have a forum to have those ideas challenged. So, on a practical level, drawing is a very important skill for engineers. So, if I had my way, I'd have all of the engineers at Dalhousie, once a week for a year, take courses at NASCAD, where they would learn to see and they'd learn to interpret with, uh, with drawing. And then they'd also learn to have hands-on experience with construction and materials through woodworking, through metalworking, through textiles. Uh, um, <laughs> That's what I get. And then they'd also learn the importance of good design and they'd import, learn the importance of handcraft skills. So this offers a new type of learning to engineers. It allows them to confidently present their ideas on the spot. To learn things such as how fabric is made and why the weave is important for the way fabric moves. The Japanese never got rid of their textile engineering programs. One of the few countries that kept textile engineering as a big program and then when it came to developing com composite materials like carbon fiber, they were leaps and bounds ahead of everybody else. Students learn the elements of good design in this type of thinking, this type of program, how that design relates to the aesthetic, and show how that uh, aesthetic relates to the usability and the adoptability of the products, products and the processes that they're, they're uh, developing. They come away with tangible skills, they understand that when they design something, that they need to understand where that product comes from and how that product is constructed. Anybody who's ever fixed a car will know that uh, mechanical engineers could do with a little bit of chatting with the people who have to fix these things. 
They also get a particular challenge that they don't get enough of in the right, wrong, answer world of engineering. So they learn how to deal when there are no right answers. We don't get a lot of that in engineering. From all of these together, it teaches them how to communicate. Communication is crucial in engineering, and we do develop aspects of that in the engineering program. With the kinds of challenges we have today in environmental challenges and looking at sustainability, we need to have multimodal methods of communicating, and we need to communicate in the community and not just among ourselves. So people who understand the big picture are, are needed for us to... Uh, <laughs> this is what I get for using cue cards. Here we go. <laughs> Another part of the engineering program is that we need to, to uh, look at who's taking it. So this is our box. This box is the engineering program. And we put into this box broad thinkers, people who need con context before they can move forward. They need to know why they're doing what they're doing. And then we put in narrow thinkers, people who are happy to focus and dig deep into a problem and just figure out exactly what this is about. And traditional engineering favors the narrow focus, but we need both of these students. We need them to uh, give us the big picture, to uh, help us check all the parts, so that when we're looking at a problem, we look at all parts of the problem, and that includes socioeconomic environmental problems. And then we need people who can push forward and get in and understand and, and squeeze a problem until they know every single part of it. We need that focus. So overall, we need purple diagonal students. The private sector is looking now for engineers who can communicate, who can be creative and efficient. And the research world needs students who can think broadly and then learn to narrow down. We need to help these students learn how to, the, the broad students, we need to help them learn how to, or the, the narrow students, we need to teach them how to think broadly. And then the broad students, we need to teach them how to find that context while there's still a chance to get the most out of those early fundamental courses. So right now, I'm addressing some of this broad thinking in a course that I teach. It's a required course. It's called Environment and Sustainability for Engineers. And it has students from many disciplines. So it's a great opportunity to talk to people across the program. It's a small step, but with a big reach. And it's a way of starting to integrate these arts concepts into their education. We begin the course with a philosophy paper, the, the uh, Garrett Hardin, Tragedy of the Commons. It's a classic paper in environmental studies. And what this paper is for a lot of these students is their first time reading a, phil a philosophy paper. It's their first time seeing that kind of language and these kinds of arguments put together. And they tend to really appreciate it. They delve in deep, they get enthusiastic about it, and they have a lot to say once we start talking about it. Uh, this this uh, paper tends to also form the the foundation of thought for the rest of the course. Next, I started looking at art galleries, and I got very lucky one semester. And uh, the art gallery at Dow was having an exhibit in environmental photography uh, at the same time that I was teaching this course. And some of the uh, photographers that were, were being uh, uh, were in the exhibit, were, one was Bertinsky, Edward Bertinsky. He takes beautiful photographs of what he can, calls manufactured landscapes. So um, open pit mines, uh, oil sands in Alberta, things like that. So we, we took uh, 110 students, engineering students, through the gallery. I don't think they've ever had engineering students as a class go through there before. And the tour guide uh, went through the classic uh, artistic interpretation of all the different pictures with them, and then helped me to develop some questions for their next assignment. And I have, uh, I've taught at OCAD, which is the Ontario College of Art and Design, so I've seen the, these kinds of answers before. And I have to say, I was very impressed with the kinds of enthusiasm and, uh, and interest that they gave in those questions. So they're more than up for the challenge. Then we added debates into the class. And what the debates do is they let these quiet, unassuming engineers get a chance to put out their opinions. <laughs> Thought that would get a laugh. Um, <laughs> they, we talk about topics such as the uh, oil wells in the Arctic, uh, subsidies for renewable energy, population control in the developing world, and does nature have a dollar value and should it? So far the debates have been quite a success. 
And I find that the dynamics of the debate take the public speaking challenge away from a lot of these students. And that uh, even though they have the option not to speak, for the most part, well, everybody so far has gotten up and, and taken the opportunity to say something. I've even had a student with a stutter who, who was really worried about getting up in front of everybody, but ended up feeling so passionate about the argument that he had to get up and say his piece. I've had students who, uh, who'd never debated before this class very soon afterwards enter a regional debating competition and win. So I could say that I think they're, uh, they're embracing it, and there's a lot of people getting quite a bit out of it. Another thing that happens in this class that I teach is that students can get very down. They can get sad. And uh, to, d to deal with that, I use TED Talks, uplifting ones, YouTube, and uh, News of the Day. It's a News of the Day item that makes the biggest difference, I find. So at the beginning of every class, I have two to three news items that deal with topics that uh, give positive solutions to environmental challenges. So they could be talking about um, a nightclub in Amsterdam, uh, where people, when they're dancing on the dance floor, generate power for the building. Or the study in Brazil, where it says if you urinate in the shower, you can conserve water. So, back to the white box. The tools of the engineer are science combined with process. The debates give the students a chance to learn how to listen and respect opposing views, and that will impact how they work with people in the future. A lot of opposing views for engineering projects out there. They also get to learn how to contextualize their work. The context is not always in the specs that come to the engineers. There was a heritage minute a few years ago, or a heritage moment on CBC a few years ago, where they had University of Waterloo engineers, and they were using the latest and greatest technology to try and develop a water pump for communities in Africa. And then they realized that they really should be copying what the Mennonites were doing, because the Mennonites had the best technology for the communities that they were trying to help. So the, uh, they ended up adapting that for, for Africa. I believe these moments should not just be moments. And we can share the way that we do things as engineers. And we can hold these ways up to critique by people who are not trained in engineering so that we can develop even better solutions. And then we can move towards the transparency of the white box. So what do the students think of all of this? <laughs> well, I would say I'd be lying if I said they're all going for it. 30 to 40 percent are enthusiastic. 10 to 15 percent are kicking and screaming. But I find that uh, as, I, as I move forward with it, that they're starting to give me more feedback, and I respond well to that. So one of the things I learned in, uh, in graduate school is that you don't wait till the end of the semester to give your feedback forms, because you can't really do anything about the things that you tried new in the class. So we do, I try to give at least a, a, an evaluation or a comment card every semester. And uh, what I find from those comment cards is that uh, there is stuff in there that can actually help me move forward the course. Now, I don't mean to say that I'm getting, letting them dictate the course, because they need to be pushed out of their boundaries and out of their comfort zones. A lot of these students will not go there willingly, mainly because they have incredible time pressures in the engineering program. They simply don't have the time. To, uh, to be exploring other ideas, because they just got to get their assignments in. So I thought it might be interesting to include a few comments that I've gotten from a recent uh, feedback. First one is what I call the sad student. I love the class. However, I would say the class always seems to look at the dark side of all that occurs in the world. In other words, this class stresses me out to live past 40. <laughs> I get a few of these every year, every semester that I teach this course, and I find that I need to really work on bringing more of those TED Talks and uh, News of the Day items in to try and keep them update, up, up, uh, upbeat and realize that there are people creating solutions and it's not, it's not all dire. This student said it better than I could. He said it's important to keep engineering students aware of social, political, and philosophical issues. Otherwise, it's very easy to get stuck in the engineering box where soft sciences are viewed with derision. It also helps to show the wide applicability of engineering problem-solving skills to the current and pressing ecological issues. So I thought that was a very important point, that we do have skills that could actually be used to solve a lot of the problems that we see out in the world today. Then there's this guy. I got one of these, and I don't really see this as very representative. Does not spark any interest whatsoever. Unfortunately, I could care less about the environment. Sorry. 
So that gave me some inspiration for a new uh, assignment question. Take one of the ecological concepts presented and explain why should you care. Thank you.